Thank you for that brief but wonderful introduction. Um, let me start my stopwatch here. And we'll begin. If you want the slides, that's the tiny URL. It's not that tiny, but I love tiny URL. Shout out to them for always giving me free, eternally living short URLs because this is a Google slide deck and I'm not giving you that entire thing. You can have it, but I'm not putting it on screen. All right. Oh, sorry. I'll give you a one, two, three, four. That's it. All right. So who in this room considers himself working in the world of DevOps? Awesome. Thank you for all of your work. Who in this room works in security? I originally had security team here, but uh, I think we should all be on the security team. And we all technically work in security. So everybody's saying it should go up. That was a trick question. All right. Who is on call right now? Really? When I, asked, I did the same talk in B-Sides SF, uh, San Francisco, and like five hands shot up. I'm like, I am so sorry for you being on call right now. Uh, but if you've ever been on call, if you've ever had to incident respond, um, who has ever rotated multiple secrets because of an incident like at the same time? Was that fun? No. Um, here's an example of somebody that had a really, really bad day rotating secrets and the thing to pay attention to is this number. Um, because of the Octa breach, which I think I'm from the, this crowd, I'm going to skim over it. Uh, attacker gets into Octa, Octa, uh, they steal HAR files, HAR files contain credentials for customers. Again, super oversimplifying. Um, they use those credentials to get into Cloudflare stuff. Cloudflare said, hey, we got this settled, don't worry. But they still got into Jira, which then got into Confluence, which then got into Bitbucket. And they're like, oh no, oh no, we missed one key, maybe two. We'll still never know. Uh, anybody from Cloudflare here that knows the exact story in Chain of Command, let me know. Um, but 5,000 keys one day. That sucks. Oh yeah, I'd introduce myself. I'm Dwayne. I live in Chicago. I've been doing developer advocacy stuff since 2016. I've been in DevOps space since 2014 in security for just about two years now. And I love security space. It's so much to learn. I love you all. Um, I co-host a repo, uh, a podcast called the Security Repo Podcast. We have everyone from Jason Haddix to Jason E. Street and a lot of other people not named Jason uh, come on and be guests. Uh, and you should check it out. The link's there, but just Google it. We're the only thing called that. Um, Oh, yeah, very briefly, I work for a company called Git Guardian. Uh, we have stickers up here. If you want stickers, that's it. Uh, we'll I, I'm later this time. very, very sorry. This is not your fault because you didn't ask for this, but your esteemed track chairs both made outrageous speaker requests. Okay. And I need just two minutes of your time, sure. if you don't mind, to, to deliver that to them. Uh, so is Cicely here? Ah, uh, Okay. So you, uh, I know kind of, at first you just said no chicken in your speaker request. Uh, this is not chicken, so technically I'm, I'm fulfilling that request. But I received an unofficial request verbally afterwards that you could change that to be uh, a, a cat named after you. So I have here a kitty, uh, a cat-themed uh, sort of uh, WAN, uh, excuse me, Wi-Fi uh, war driving device that you can assemble. And I have named this one Seek Le WAN after Sicily WAN. <laughs> Hold it up. Can you hold it up for her? I can hold it up for her. <laughs> so some assembly required, but there are instructions online. I can help you find them if you need. Thank you very much. Okay. And then you. <laughs> you, sir. I, I want to read specifically from the text because you I, uh, you, I, I was, uh, <laughs> uh, you wrote, and I quote, surprise me. I know how this works. You cannot offend me. Okay, so I think I'm absolved of whatever comes after this. Is that, do you agree? <laughs> All right, still friends no matter what? Still friends no matter what. Okay. Um, Here is your speaker uh, request. So, uh, <laughs> 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 Run. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I won't make you put it on. <laughs> anyway, did I succeed? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Undefeated. All right. 
I'm very sorry. Thank you for the time. You have to turn the gun away. Sorry. Oh, okay. I mean, <laughs> You all can literally just go watch this on the uh, B-side San Francisco. So if you'd prefer that and go do whatever you're doing now. Sorry. Uh, all right. I love how I didn't get anything, but another speaker did. Um, just pointing that out. Just pointing that out for next year. Feedback. It's critical. All right. The good news. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this happened. Just to remind you, if you haven't paid attention, 5,000 keys. Need to be rotated in bed today. Uh, oh yeah, Git Guardian. Uh, we do secret stuff that'll come up later. I'll explain it then. We also do SCA, uh, source composition analysis, but our, again, that doesn't really come up here. All right, we know how our attackers behave. In fact, we know how they behave so much that we wrote it down. And we wrote it down in such a way that attackers read this and they know how to behave which is kind of a weird paradox we live in. It's like when the Lapsus group, not Lapsus, yeah, when Lapsus, like somebody said, hey, this is the Lapsus playbook. Guess what? We just made a bunch of copycats that now know the Lapsus playbook. So Vishen is only gonna go through the roof. Thanks everybody doing security research and being very public about it. But also the security research out there. I'm sorry, dude. So this one's on you. <laughs> So you put in a request for an outrageous request. Please accept this talk. So we have, for the very first time in Security B-Side's history, accepted a talk purely because the speaker asked us to accept the talk. <laughs> it's pretty outrageous. <laughs> now, uh, this is the first and only presenter ever invited uh, because of his outrageous speaker request. Uh, hopefully the talk is decent because we sure didn't read the abstract or anything so there you go. No, actually that's all BS all right. it's a great talk we just there you go there's your certificate oh thank you very much I do I should appreciate that <laughs> it does make me good feel hack. better about good hack. that loophole has been closed now by the way so you're on all right I'm gonna leave that there for pictures later I'll pose with it five dollars a picture I'll go on the strip and do it there uh, okay Point being, uh, thank you security researchers who do tell us this stuff. I love Sofo so much. I don't use any other products, but I read the reports every time they publish anything. Um, last year, there was an interesting fact that popped up across all these reports that said uh, the number one root cause of all of our breaches are credentials, exposed, leaked, stolen. That's for the first time ever that the majority and that wasn't just Sophos that said that. IBM says this. Verizon DBR said that. Actually, Verizon said 49%, but close enough. Uh, CISA said it's 54. Um, interesting enough, they said, uh, Sophos said 17% are because of vulnerabilities. Theoretically, we're getting better at patching, or we're getting a lot worse at the credential thing. So attackers depend on multiple things in the MITRE framework, our attack framework, uh, of your credentials working when they find them. If they find a bunch of garbage, they can do a lot of things with that, but they're expecting them to work when they use them. Otherwise, why would they try? So, I told you to come back. I work for a company called Git Guardian, and for the first prize of the day, you didn't know there'd be prizes, but for the first prize of the day, which is a surprise, uh, who knows how many secrets we discovered on GitHub Public last year. And if you ever read this report, please let other people guess. Uh, and this is Price is Right rules, closest without going over wins. Uh, and we can look up the exact number if we get down to that. Um, who knows how many secrets we found on GitHub Public last year that were added just in the year 2023, just to GitHub Public. And by secret, I mean an API key, something that grants access to some other system. Oh, what? 10,000? Another. Two million. 100 million. 100 Other. 10 million. One. One dollar, Bob. Fifty thousand. Fifty thousand. What? Million one. Four seventy-five k. Four seventy-five k. Forty-two. Forty-two. I love that answer. That's a perfect answer for a lot of things. But that wasn't it. Uh, I think ten was the. I'm just going to cut it off there. Uh, ten was the closest because it was twelve point seven seven eight million. Uh, so you win a. Woo! Please pass that to her. Uh, you win an octopus that I crocheted on the plane out here. Uh, I like octopuses. Uh, yeah, this is a shockingly disturbing number, to me anyway. Uh, but the biggest problem is this keeps going up, not down. 
in 2020 when they first published this report, which is a long story, another story I'll share with you over a drink. Uh, that's how I ended up working here is because of that report. Um, we found 3 million and then they found 6 million the next year and then 10 million. That's not cumulative. That's just added per year. How we write this report is we're one of the companies that looks at every single new commit and every new is public event that hits at the API. Uh, it's a one point roughly of 1 billion things, actions last year that we ingested and we look for secrets. Uh, we send out pro bono alerts to all the committers if it's a working email, if they're not on a ban list, to say, hey, you did this, you should fix this, and we're trying to be good about it. We found the research last year that we started looking for validation repeatedly. So the ones we could validate out uh, of the uh, ones we did find that were valid um, were still valid five days after they had been leaked. 90% of those, we're talking millions. Um, you can go read the full report to figure out the whole breakdown. The, it's free, no sign up required. You can do it through a anonymous window and tour or whatever. So how did we get here? I ask myself this a lot. Whenever I'm looking at a problem, like why did we do this? Because I believe behind every good problem, there's an engineer who had really good intentions. All you need to do is look at the UI on your phone and know that a developer spent a lot of time thinking about how their life could be better if they didn't have to program it. And then that is handed to a designer who messed it all up. Um, but how did we get to the situation we're in today? I think it started here. Uh, we had these things called Univax and these giant machines that spread across rooms and literal bugs were literal bugs. Uh, and how did we guard this? Well, the Navy was involved, thanks Grace Hopper. Um, and we locked the door. We put a guard out front to shoot anybody that's trying to steal our secrets. Uh, and if they, they, then they can't steal our paper punch cards that have all our data. Uh, and they can't mess with the hardware to sabotage us. It's literally the beginning of the warfare that we're still experiencing today. This is why there's no difference between the civilian and national security sector, in my opinion, is because it's the same game. We've been playing it the whole time. Let's move forward in time a little bit to more modern era. I just discovered this uh, the other day that Stephen Bourne, who wrote SH, um, his password was Bourne. That blows my mind that the father of my favorite interactive thing used his own last name for a password. Anyway, but okay, we need to lock the door still. Can't mess with the hardware because these are all stupid terminals that are connected to a, a mainframe somewhere or a big um, Unix box. But the main use case we're trying to solve is stop users from playing Zork on company time because uh, that's expensive. And sending emails from accounts that don't know. And that was a big problem at Stanford in the early days. Like you could just guess someone's super simple password and then hack your friends and have fun. Uh, and then the cuckoo's egg happened and it kind of got very serious very fast. I raise your hand if you've never read the cuckoo's egg. That is your homework assignment from me. I have several, but that is your homework. Go read it. It's a fun read. Clifford's a great weirdo, uh, but he's a great writer. Um, and then jump forward to the modern era, quote unquote, and we got this thing where any server in the world can be any machine in the world and it runs these things called websites and we have applications now that run on the web that anyone can access all you need is an address and a browser so hey ttl or tls ssl great idea stops the person in the middle attack or the uh, attacker in the middle attack um and passwords still work right hey that's how i get in that's how i admin still works and then we get to this madness thanks click it I met these guys and told them I using the slide and they've never heard of me before. So I was very happy that I got to use their stuff. Um, we get to this world of very complex interconnected systems. And what did we do? We threw passwords at it, but in the form of API keys and SSH keys and certificate authorities at best. Who works at a company that has a dedicated PKI team? Good. I'm guessing it's a Fortune 100. Uh, <laughs> that's what the numbers were CISOs say. Um, this prevents unauthorized access to your machine resources, and this is good. This is the, what the goal is, to um, stop people from getting to your admin. All right, next prize. Guess, according to current research, how outnumbered we are humans to machine identities. Very quickly, a human identity is a human who has to do something to interact with the system. A machine identity is not a human who needs to interact with another system to do something. That's the definition I'm using. All right, any, any guesses? How what? We're calling it dead internet theory. Dead? What? What do you get? I, I, I can't understand what you're saying. Sorry, the mask. Dead internet theory. I've never heard of it. No. All right. So uh, I'm looking for a number because this is for a prize. 100 to 1. 
uh, million to one, hundred to one, how much? 10 to one. 10 to one? 10 to one? 10,000 to one. 10,000 to one? 50 to one. 50 to one? Who said 10 to one for, oh, yeah, I'll go there. Okay, who said 10 to one first? You said it first, yes. Uh, you won the other octopus that's much smaller because I ran out of yarn. I'll pass that back to her, please. Um, and the correct answer, if we believe my good friends at CyberArk, and I love CyberArk for a number of reasons, they'll come up later too, is 45 to one. I think it's actually 46 to one, according to the next update, which means for every thousand people that you need to identify within your system, there's 46,000 machine identities running around. And there are, this is Kubernetes workloads, this is anything requesting a thing from another thing that's not a human. That's what that looks like, just to put it in blunt terms. This is the problem we're dealing with today. We've heard a lot in this password con, and I love that we're talking about it. Like, how do we secure this person over here? I think there's some good paths there. I do. Cracking aside, and all the ways you can mean that, uh, this is the problem set. And I think what got us to where we are today isn't the way forward. We can't just keep doing this over and over again. Otherwise, there's no future to look forward to. It's just pure hell we're walking into slowly. So what do we do? First, I think there's these two things. Uh, eliminate all credentials where possible. For some things, that's entirely possible. There's a way to do that through IAM rules, depending on your system, depending on how you're set up. I'm not telling you what they are, but there are ways to accomplish that. You can march down that path, but you'll always have the problem that eventually you need two systems to talk to each other that you can't just give a rule to. Think Salesforce versus Google Cloud. Yes, you have to interact with those things sometimes. Uh, when humans are involved, there's these things called phishing resi resistant MFA paths, YubiKey, biometrics, YubiKey plus biometrics, the most expensive of the YubiKeys, but they work awesome. Uh, I love my computer because it's an M2 that I can have a fingerprint and it opens things and with one pass, uh, I can do all sorts of crazy things with just my fingerprint. And then the last one, if you do have to use credentials, let's rotate them very, 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 very fast. I got quoted in CSO online a few weeks ago on an offhanded comment I made to the reporter. It's like, humans hate changing their passwords, but machines don't care. So we should be changing them a lot faster. He left off the last part, so it's just machines don't care. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, that's what I think. And this is my opinion from here on out on, on this point of view, and you're welcome to argue with me out in the hall, but I think we have a clear path for humans overall, and it's called MFA. It's called uh, ID verification. First talk of yesterday talked about that deeply. For machines, it's a big old question mark sitting out there right now. So instead of going down and talking about all the question marks and the ways we can solve this, I'll get to that later, I promise. Uh, I'm going to talk about what we do in the meantime, and that's the auto rotation, because that's something achievable. That's something people grasp. That's something other people in this room have given talks about. Thank goodness, other people are talking about this out loud. And I think it boils down to just do these two things. You just gather all your secrets into one secrets manager, and then you set an auto-rotation policy. And I realize that's like telling you how to fly. Just don't fall down. A, I think, thanks to uh, ChatGPT for making this really stupid, weird image. The longer you look at it, the weirder it gets. Um, like, what are those birds? Are those what is that? What is that? Anyway, um, so, word of caution before we go any further. Because I've had somebody at another talk say, hey, I want to go do this. And that's like my full-time job now. I'm like, no, no, it shouldn't be. Uh, don't boil the ocean with this. You're going to have to go step at a time. In fact, I think you should go bird by bird. Uh, again, if you've never read this book, read it. Nothing to do with our field, but oh, it's such a great book. If you're going to write a book about birds, how do you do it? You go bird by bird. It's that simple. Uh, so you go secret by secret. So you got to make a plan. And that plan is going to involve multiple things. And this is what I think you should be asking. The first is who owns this approach? Uh, for the third prize, which is not hand crocheted, I promise, it's something cool. Um, who knows at what revenue level your average company has a full-time IAM person? Like that is their job, is we handle IAM for the corporation. I'll enterprise, I'll use the word enterprise, not corporation, for the enterprise. I have a dedicated full-time, I report straight to the CISO and this is what I do, we make IAM happen. What's the, what's the revenue line? What? 100 mil. 100 mil? Other guesses? Okay. Double down saloon. Double down saloon? That's not a number, but okay. 50 mil? 40? What? what? 1 million? Billion. 1 billion? Uh, well, that's the last one back there. 250 million? 
I'm gonna go close without going over. I don't have it on the slide, but this is IAN research uh, from RSA. It's five billion dollars before a company's big enough. So I'm gonna not throw this because I will come up and get this later. This is a, a frisbee. If I'm gonna hurt somebody, this is hard plastic. This will hurt somebody. So come up later, get that. It's yours. Um, so you gotta have somebody that owns the approach. And it can't we we can't wait till five billion dollars. We have to get this now. We have to get a jump on it right now. But someone has to own this and spearhead this and be like, this is the thing and be the voice in the desert saying, this has got to get done. This is what we got to do. We're going to shepherd this through. This is the vision. We're selling it. We're doing it. We're loving it. Could be your CISO. Could be your CEO. I hope it's your CEO. I would love to meet that CEO, though. Um, second, you need to ask if your company is, your organization is mature enough to do this. If you were two people that just started on a prototype last week, maybe not. Uh, if you are a team of 50 that have a product out the bark for two years, you're late to the game. That's what I think. But I think there's a map for this. That's what I gave, the talk I gave last year. And that's what that link goes to is that talk. Um, uh, not that talk, the research is based on the secret management maturity model. Something we came up with at Git Guardian to try to evaluate how people are going from, all my secrets are just everywhere willy nilly to, oh, this is how professional enterprises with 20 to 30,000 developers deal with this day to day. And we help people figure out their place in that map. Um, Will your devs go along with it? This is a question you have to ask. And if the answer is no, maybe you need another company because you guys a culture thing I don't know how to fix. This is Dora Metrics 101 stuff. This is like, I don't know. I don't know that one. But there has to be a path for them. And I'll talk about the path I think is, is appropriate. And then you gotta ask, where are our secrets? The first rule of API security is knowing you have API. That, that's it, that's the first rule. Um, if you don't know how many APIs you have and how many endpoints you have, you'll never be able to secure it. All right, so let's make a plan. The only actionable one on this list I'm going to talk about is the last one, because let's assume you got all the buy-in, let's assume you figure out the path. We'll talk about three a little bit, but let's just figure out that we got, we got answers to that. We got a path, we got a vision. First is we're going to gather all the secrets into one manager. This is an oversimplification and the full extent of my artistic ability uh, explaining what a secrets manager is. Uh, developer, instead of writing their secrets to uh, the specific thing they're writing, they write to a secrets manager and then call that secrets manager programmatically from the thing they're writing. Th that's, it, that's it, whether it's to get data, whether it's you know, whatever they're doing. But that's how it authenticates. That's how it, uh, do auth and auth z with it. Um, Oh, sorry, wrong way. Uh, so the basics needs for a secret manager, in my opinion, and the research in the, in the industry right now is it encrypts data, it encrypts your secrets at rest and in transit. Very important. If you can't do it over MTLS, don't do it. Well, I guess you could do it whatever you want to, but as long as it's encrypted in transit. Um, it's available across all environments. This is hard. This is one of the hardest things on this list. Three, centralized reporting might be the most important one on this list. If you can't keep track of it, you don't really got a vault on your hands. You have a list that you lost track of. Um, and it's gotta be easy enough, again, for developers to say, oh, I can do that. That's pretty straightforward. In fact, that's easier than what I've been doing. Good news, if you're all in on a cloud provider, like you are 100% AWS, there's a great solution for you. It's called AWS Secrets Manager. If you are 100% on Azure, it's called Key Vault, which has great documentation. I'm gonna give them credit where it's due. Secret manager from Google Cloud, you're gonna have your own experiences with, but it's still there, it's still good. If you're 100% in it to win it, and this is all you do, this is your answer. If you're in multi-cloud, that's where HashCorp Vault comes in. Uh, that's where CyberArk comes in. They make a thing called Conjure, among other things they make. Uh, Achilles, I love those people. Doppler from Down Under, uh, they're from Australia. They are a wonderful company to work with. If you see them, go up to their booth and they're great people if you ever at an event where they're there. So, that's the secret manager I'm talking about. So how do you use these? If you've never used a vault before, has anybody in this room never touched a vault before? Okay, I can skip this part. Um, you basically give a path to programmatically call something out of the vault. There's, you put it in the vault programmatically, there's keys. I'm not gonna explain all the encryption here because I don't have that much time. But uh, you basically put a secret in it, you call it out programmatically. So instead of writing the hard-coded secret, you write this and you pull the secret out. It loads it in the environment at runtime and you're good to go. So which secrets do you put in? Again, we're gonna go bird by bird. Which do you focus on? New secrets are an obvious win. 
hey, we got a brand new project. Great, Greenfield is the best place to do anything. But all reality, we don't work in Greenfields most of the time. So what's your crown jewels? What, when, what are you guarding the hardest? If it goes down, where do you lose the most money? That's how I think of crown jewels. Uh, Walmarts.com uh, support portal for customer service can go down for several days and they'll be fine. Um, uh, but if their actual payment gateway goes down, then that's bad. Um, that was a joke on Walmart's part. Uh, anyway, legacy secrets should go next and then zombie secrets are last. What are zombie secrets you ask? How many people know all of the secrets that you have, all the passwords for your entire company and for every system you've ever turned on? How many know how many systems are even running in your environment? Yeah, those are zombie secrets. Um, so how do you find your secrets? You write an email to your all company and you say, you list all your passwords in plain text in an email. Obviously don't do that, that's stupid. Um, so how do you actually do this? Well, there are tools for this. I work at one of the companies that founded this industry and built this stuff. Uh, Git Guardian, um, but Truffle Logs, open source, they're awesome. They also have an enterprise product. Uh, Git Leaks, the person who invented Git Leaks, now works for Truffle Hog, so is it still maintained? That's a question. Um, but awesome products. Again, I'm not gonna never not I'm never gonna say anything bad about open source because they're doing awesome stuff in the open source world. There's other companies like PingSafe and there's other people that do this. Uh, but PingSafe is just the first one that came up on who competes with these two. All right, so we scan and we find all the secrets, put them in one place. I'm not gonna sell you on the virtues of one approach or the other, but eventually they're in one place. Um, a platform, a list, somewhere. Okay, we got them all, we found them all. Now let's set an auto rotation policy. The script logic needs to work simply like this. You need to create a new secret for the one that's in play, test that new secret will actually work through some kind of method. That's optional, but highly recommended. Swap it in for the new secret, make sure that nothing broke, and then clean up from the internal, or clean from the step. Basically, blue-green deployment. Hey, there's the blue one. Green one's right here in case you gotta roll back. Patch Court Vault has this as a built-in button. We gotta roll back, bam, we're done. In fact, yesterday there was a whole talk about this exact thing that you can go find online right now that it will talk way more about the details and the specifics of how to do this properly than I can possibly get into from this higher level talk. So perfect, thank you so much for giving this talk uh, yesterday, Ken. Um, and go ask him if you have specific questions about implementing HashCorp Vault, not me. Um, Set you up for success. All right, so if you're all in the cloud provider, this is actually really easy to do. In fact, where I got this list from was reading all the scripts from AWS and how they do it. This is their, this is their formula, but all the formula is the same. It's the same cake you're baking. Order of operation, where the testing goes, A, B, C, like whatever you're labeling them, that's gonna vary. But again, if you're all in 100%, there's a path for you. It's pretty straightforward. In fact, they wrote it for you. You don't have to do anything. You just like go pull this, throw it in the right field, and you're done. You got to name some things, but obviously it's you're not 100% done. You're 80% done. Um, hooray! If you just want to see how this works, again, all open source. You can just go look at this all your day and study how they did it. Multi-cloud is going to be a little bit rougher because now you have to figure out if there's a way to update or request a new secret or even interact with the secrets from the APIs. For most systems, for most modern systems, there better be. And if there's not, you call them and say, you give me this or I'm going to your competitor that has it because this is mandatory for the future. Um, and then you have your vault system interact with that system. This is why I like CyberArk because Conjure does this. They have a way, a path to call external APIs to trigger this. Uh, CircleCI's looks like that, Slacks looks like that. Doesn't matter how you call it. These are just trivial examples. The idea is the more important thing here. And then I think there's a world where we can tie all of this stuff together really well. Um, and that is we use the secret detection tools we already have, and that's how we found them in the first place, to further automate the process. So upon discovery, because you should be constantly scanning for secrets, it's not a one and done thing. It's not SAST where you're, I'm scanning for vulnerabilities right now in this version and we're good because we won't add any more problems, right? Uh, no, this is every new time you touch the code, we gotta remake sure that no one put a plain text secret here or did something that will expose the secret. So let's find any secrets. And then let's go check if they're in the vault. Might be, hopefully they are. If they're not in the vault, let's put it in the vault. 
And here's the part that's a little bit tricky, but why I think it will work with the developer. So let's go ahead and change the code. Let's go ahead with scripting logic to say, if we're calling a password to this system, here's the exact call that would look like if we were calling it in Vault. And this is go ahead and make the PR. That's a lot of logic, that's a lot of steps. I over oversimplified there and I'm realizing now that should be three slides. But again, when you write your talk three minutes before you get on stage, you forget things. And then eventually you rotate the secret. But this is possible. There's a great language called Bash based on this thing called SH, which a guy used his own last name as a password in, which is weird. But it still works. Bash is universal, it's true. Python works too, I guess, if you like Python. Um, but if it's true that you found the secret and it's already in the vault, well, you still need to make the PR to replace that line of code, but now all you gotta do is update the secret. You don't need to put it in the vault. You're just like, oh, this is probably already accounted for somewhere. Let's just call it, hooray, we rotate, we win. And if you're thinking right now, who on earth would do this? We did this, uh, minus the auto PR step. But again, that's a scripting lines. You can you need to modify based on your specific setup and needs right yourself. But we got the rest of the scripting and logic for you. It's called Brimstone is the thing we ended up calling it. Uh, the actual GitHub repo, which is linked if you click that, is a really long name that CyberArk came up with. Um, but ultimately, Brimstone was the name we all settled on. Um, uh, brimstone and I forget the name of the thing it's built on. Um, but basically Brimstone's the last thing. Um, yeah, it does this. Auto find with us, communicate with CyberArk. A lot of steps in here. And right now you probably are thinking, like I was thinking when I saw this, oh, and there's a full demo of this. This is again, this isn't vaporware. You can go do this right now, but you can also watch the videos of how we did this and it's all open source. Like Brimstone itself is open source. You can dig through and see exactly how the calls are made and how we're accounting for the fact that we can't communicate or shouldn't communicate a plain text secret over the wire between two systems. We've already thought of that, don't worry. Um, this involves hashing and fingerprints and a lot of backflips. But if you're like me and you think, this is a whole new level of middleware I got to run. Wow, that's brittle. Who's going to maintain that? I don't disagree with you. This is possible, though. This is the current where we go next. But it's not where we're going eventually. It's how S-bombs are a step in the right direction, but they're not the final point. This is our next logical, I can't possibly do the thing you're about to talk about next, but I can do this. And we can get here, and we can get here, we can get there, I think. Because I think instead of all this, and hear me out, password con, um, we just accept that credentials, the way we've been doing them, are a terrible way to approach machine identities, just fundamentally. We made a mistake 40 years ago, 30 years ago, when we start having two servers talk to each other and need to identify that adding a password in the mix was, especially a long-lived password that never rotates, was a terrible idea. So what do we do instead? Welcome to the world of Spiffy. I love the Cloud Native Security, Con uh, Cloud Native Security Foundation. I love OpenSSF. I just spoke at Cloud Native Security Con like three weeks ago, or very end of June. So wow, we're already in August. The very end of, of June and back in Seattle. And there's so much excitement and wonderful motion happening around this world. I'm gonna dumb oversimplify it because again, I'm almost out of time. But imagine a world where everything just gets a namespace that can be checked by a federated certificate authority system universally that says, yeah, you're you. Here is a cert that lasts just as long as your request. Oh, you can't do it with a 509 cert? Here's a jot. Not as good, but here it works. Hey, you can have the request. As soon as the request is finished, bam, it vanishes. It never existed. Anybody finds it, it's useless. All you know is what certs look like and what a jot looks like and when it expired, I guess. Spiffy is secure protection, ah, production identity framework for everyone invented for Kubernetes by people that built Kubernetes and expanded out to the whole rest of the world. Spire is the implementation. So if we think of OAuth as the set of ideals that we should be chasing and why it's not a proper framework, you can think of um, OpenConnect ID as the thing that you implemented. Spire is the thing you implement. They're both open source ideas. Uh, I didn't put them on the slides, but uh, there's companies doing this now as a service. Istio is one of the tones that jumps to mind. There's others. They're just the first one I'm going to name. For sake of time, let's move on. Oh, yeah. So this is what it basically does. Uh, 
yeah, again, I'm just reading a website to you at this point. Um, but the important thing is that you can have one central certificate authority that might go down, might be unreachable, or you federate this across everything and you sidecar this in the world. And this just becomes how we think about this. From a developer standpoint, this is one extra line of code they need to throw in and never have to think about a password ever again. It just magically works. And that's a promise that I've seen fulfilled on stage. I watched someone implement MTLS by hand on a talk that's online from Cloud Native Security Con. Uh, implement, implement MTLS by hand over the course of about 10 minutes, painfully and account for on all the clients. And then she did this and three lines of code later, magically MTLS for every communication. There is a much, much, much better talk than what I just gave about it from Cloud Native Security Con this year. That's the link to it. Highly recommend you watch it. This is the most entertaining talk I've seen in years about the story of Crush and how he identified and how he talked to the Postgres squid and like the, all they, they, they used under the sea whole thing. It's beautiful, but it explains the concept brilliantly in the future. The problem I think with it, and this isn't really a criticism, is that they live three years to five years in the future. The people building this, they kind of do. I love them and they're doing the right direction and they're telling us where we can go next, but I don't know a lot of companies that can jump to this right now. Small companies, new projects, absolutely. This instead of building the other thing I, I talked about. You're an enterprise, this is where you're eventually gonna be headed. Search for everything, PKI everywhere. I am run by a team that's not security because it's IAM. So in conclusion, this is where I wanna be at three in the morning. I wanna sleep there. I wanna be not worried about someone breaking into my stuff or that a password got stolen or that someone got in because of a password. All we gotta do is gather all your secrets in one place and set an auto rotation policy. That's all we gotta do. I know that's, that's, all, we gotta do. that's all we gotta do. I know it's like saying, just don't fall down. Just don't fall down. But we can do this if we don't try to boil an ocean. We can just do it bird by bird and think, how am I gonna deal with this secret and make sure this one doesn't leak? And if you only do one secret a week, that's 52 secrets you do in a whole year. Maybe 50 with vacations. That is so much better than where we are going right now. It doesn't keep up with it, so hopefully you'll go a lot faster once you figure out how to automate things. But start small, and it get, leads to very large things. Eventually, this is where I think we're going. But we can't jump here, I think, for the most part because of the way enterprises work today and the fact that m not all services agree on this and not all services, uh, not all cloud providers agree on this, but Conjure and CyberVault uh, and Sa uh, HashCorp's Vault both do. You can use that as a springboard to get here. I left that part out earlier, sorry, I got a little out of order. Anyway, I'm a Dwayne, I live in Chicago, check out the Security Repo podcast, we have all sorts of great guests. And uh, if you weren't, I loved karaoke, I did karaoke last night. If anybody wants to do karaoke tonight, we'll make it happen. And with that, uh, yeah, I'll uh, open up for any questions. And that's where you can get the slides. Questions? Um, I'm sitting here and going back 20 years and, and domain administration and going, okay, that's nice in the sense of getting to one, but realistically, when you're talking about passwords from everything from routers to switches to laptops to mm -hmm. laps, all the domain admin crap that you need to deal with and the legacy crap that's still in all of our environments, how do you handle that to one or do you go to two or three? What, what's the theory on that? One to two, three what? Meaning, I, I, like if I stand up and, okay, here's my experience new organization startup born into the cloud yep. ado adopts this from the beginning totally perfect 100 percent. organization's been around for more than 20 years they have a legacy ad architecture that yep. may be halfway split into uh azure ad but you still have got think think of what happened with crowdstrike yeah the local password was the issue for people being able to get into that machine mm -hmm. and you use something like laps to constantly rotate that but that's not centralized into the Azure uh, AD or the secrets manager within the cloud. It's actually still a one-off credential yeah. that is out there. So I can use one for my cloud environment, but for the rest of this, 
How do we handle that? Well, that's where enterprise vaults like really come in. Um, and something that somebody at CyberArk, I forget his name, Evan, I can't remember his last name, uh, CyberArk said in an interview I did with him once, um, I'm not telling everybody to put everything in CyberArk and we are the be all end all, but you can coordinate through us to have a view into everything. And if, if you can get to there where you know about everything and everything is centrally accounted for, that should be where we're marching to next. Like that, that's why that's first is let's figure out what we have. So it's hard. So the, the, one of the problems with Spiffy right now, uh, Inspire, the way it exists right now is Postgres can't account for it. You can give it a jot, but that's janky at best. But it's Postgres we're talking about. Like how much of the internet is Postgres right now? Um, so this isn't a solvable problem. Like I have a simple pat solution for you, unfortunately, but those are the conversations that are driving right now. And like we're trying to solve, I'm not trying to solve them, but the, the people that are building the stuff are trying to solve them. Um, there's not a great answer for that other than if your vault systems can't account for on-prem cloud and all your endpoint devices, you need to have a conversation with somebody that builds vaults, like that makes those, like HashCorp would love to have that conversation with you. I'm on the other end of it. I'll help you find your secrets wherever they are. If you got a log, I can find it. Any more questions for Dwayne? Sir. So I'm going to ask you a question that we had to deal with on our side, right, as, as evangelists of this. And I have a solution that I don't know how well I like, so I'm curious what, what yours is. So sure. no matter, once you collect all of your secrets, right, you're going to find some stuff that is just for crap applications that never thought anyone would ever want to rotate it using an API, right? So yep. the only way for you to get in and, like, change it is log in as a human and do a two-factor push and click through five shiny UIs. And eventually you press a button that regenerates something, and you got to copy that out. How do you deal with that? Or, or credentials of that type that are just not suited to automation when collecting them in a vault and trying to rotate them? I wish there's a good answer to that other than business uh, business case. If it's a crappy service that's not being used or being used in one place, that's a bad business case for using a tool. If there's a clear cloud provider solution that is modern that you can hit with an API endpoint and or hit an API endpoint and do everything you need to do that is comparable in price, what's the refactor cost? At some point, and this is the truth, every business needs to roll the dice and say, if somebody took this over, we would lose five dollars. I'm okay with that. If someone takes breaks in and steals our crown jewels, our company goes away and we all lose our jobs. Those are the very end extremes. The other example I like to use on the, the low end is a, a picture, a folder full of cat photos. Sure, I want everyone on the internet to see that. I don't care what the password is. I don't care if I can rotate the credential. I don't care. And that's it. You have to care. And I don't know what your business cares about. So that's that's why it's a hard question to answer. Um, but it, you're describing a world with click ops and you get, we got to get away from click ops. That's a whole other discussion in DevOps. ClickOps is dead. It died years ago. It just keeps lingering, and Microsoft community keeps it alive. <laughs> okay. Question? No. No questions. Yeah, one last one. One uh, last one. Out of time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry, it's not a question. It's more of a Jeopardy answer. Okay. Clifford Stoll, the author of The Cuckoo's Egg, yeah. now runs this topological business out of San Francisco. Klein flasks. I didn't even get to do do, 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 do. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I broke it for you. Uh, yeah, Cl Clifford Stoll, uh, out-of-work astronomer who got a job and tried to track down 75 cents in discrepancy at a time when it was a $300 an hour to rent the machines. Uh, it's an amazing book. Amazing Don't reveal book. the secrets. It's current, an amazing book. His current... The current business is selling Klein flasks. His largest collection of Klein flasks in the world. They're one-sided objects. They're amazing. It, it's like a three-dimensional Mobius strip. Yeah. And it's worth buying one just to get the, the page of jokes that comes with it. I've never bought one. <laughs> I'm going to buy one today. <laughs> I'm buying one today. Uh, Oh, I want to see this. I can probably find it online, but I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support Clifford Stoll other than just reading his book. It's freaking amazing. And also, yeah. if, if you're like, I did not want to read a whole book, one, read the book. But two, there's a Nova special from 1990 starring Clifford Stoll called The KGB, The Computer, and Me. It's free on YouTube. 
uh, and it's all the people, the actors, like every actor or actual person they could get from the real world that experienced this that's in the book, they got to be in the Nova documentary. So you're like getting to watch like real history unfold. It's amazing. And do you also know that in Germany they made a movie about that thing from seen from the hacker's perspective? Are they make movies outside of the US? That does exist. Yep. <laughs> I'm if, American, if I'm you have either. ever heard the phrase torrent, you might be able to find it. Uh, Pirate Bay shut down, man. Did I, I say that torrents. on YouTube? Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. So, anyway, right. thank you, thank Dwayne. Thank you very much. Uh, yep. Enjoy the rest of your B-sides.